The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, A rich man had a steward who was reported to him for dissipating his property. He summoned him and he said, What is this I hear about you? Prepare a full account of your stewardship because you can no longer be my steward. The steward said to himself, What shall I do now that my master is taking the position of steward away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from my stewardship, they may welcome me into their homes. He called his master's debtors one by one. To the first he said, how much do you owe my master? He replied, 100 measures of olive oil. He said to him, here is your promissory note. Sit down and quickly write one for 50. And then to another steward he said, and how much do you owe my master? He replied, 100 cores of wheat. The steward said to him, here is your promissory note, write one for 80. And the master commended that dishonest steward for acting prudently. For the children of this world are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than the children of light. I tell you, Make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth, so that when it fails, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. The person who is trustworthy in very small matters is also trustworthy in great ones, and the person who is dishonest in very small matters is also dishonest in great ones. If, therefore, You are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth. Who will trust you with your own wealth? If you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another, who will trust you with your own? No servant is greater than his master. He will either hate the one and serve the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Quite a gospel passage, huh? Yeah? You understand it? No? Most people don't. Uh, But very interesting, and it's related to the first reading. The first reading from the prophet Amos. Amos lived about 760 B.C. He was a sheep herder. And he felt the Lord calling him. He called him from the southern territory of Judah to come to Israel and preach to the people. And he was specifically commissioned to speak to them about their social injustice, the corruption, and the shallowness of their religion. And to warn them of the coming destruction. He became a great champion of justice. He assailed the oppression of the poor as well as the justice system which did not provide for the poor to have any cause in the justice system. And the short reading today is a wonderful insight into uh, the prophet. He depicts the greed of the wealthy who can't wait for the holy days to be over so that they can get back to their money-making and dishonest practices. He says, when will the new, you, you ask, when will the new moon be over so that you can sell your grain and the Sabbath that we may display our wheat? We will diminish the epa and the shekel, the weighing uh, of these products that we are selling and fix our scales for cheating. Amos is condemning those who pay lip service to the Lord, who come on the Sabbath to celebrate, but throughout the course of the week they exploit the poor and exploit others. 
It's a very relevant thought. 2,700 years later, it's still a very important thought. How can we come on the Sabbath, proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives, and then go forth during the course of the week and not live that reality? And that has got to be one of the most real questions for all of us. Why is that so difficult? For over 2,000 years since the coming of the Christ, when he came into our world to show us how to live and how to work in relationship with one another, and he invites us to join him in that same experience, and yet that is the most difficult thing in the world for human beings. How can we celebrate here in the Sabbath? You know, and hey, sometimes we have people saying, man, when is it going to be over? You know, that's natural enough. But it's a, a, an important reflection on ourselves as well as those out there. What is the purpose of my Eucharistic celebration? It's an invitation to be a part of his way. He invites us to hear his word and then to go and attempt to give it application during the course of the week. But we have our own natural tendencies, and that is to do it our way. He invites us to do it his way. It's sort of like if I want to be an effective Christian, what does it take on my part? If I want to be... Uh, great piano player like Alan or a, a great uh, guitarist like Jim or bass player like Andy or drummer or if I want to be a great singer, if I want to be a great soccer player, if I want to be a great TV personality, it takes practice, 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 practice. And one of the greatest challenges for us as followers of Christ is to practice Practice what he is inviting us to. To be a, an effective Christian in the modern world that takes practice, I've got to begin to implement the plan. Our small group study begins today, Walking the Disciples' Path. It's a great text, and we're really excited about it. Uh, Linda Rooney does a great job in this book. In fact, we were so excited about this book, we decided we would give a copy to everybody. Even if you're not able to be in a small group, we invite you to pick up a copy and to follow along with us in this great study. It's a great material. Um, Walking the Disciples' Path. The subtitle is Eight Steps That Will Change Your Life and the World. Uh, we realize that not everybody can be in a small group, and so we encourage you to read the text along with us. The first chapter uh, deals with a very powerful issue in our own lives. She invites us to surrender our nets. It's what Jesus did when he called those first disciples. We heard the uh, passage. He goes along by the Sea of Galilee, and he sees them mending their nets in their boats, and he says, leave your nets behind. Linda Rooney uses this as a great metaphor for us. What things do we need to leave behind in order to really engage in following him? What are some of the things that we have continued to bring forth throughout all of our lives that are not helpful in hearing his invitation to follow? And the gospel today gives us another insight into that. So as you are studying, uh, I invite you to be attentive to that, that gospel message. How do we practice on a daily basis what it means to be a real follower? Last week we heard the gospel from uh, Luke chapter 15, all of Luke chapter 15, and now we pick up directly on chapter 16. The gospel last week, you remember, was the three parables? Remember? The good shepherd, the woman who lost the coin, and the threat of losing her marriage proposal, and the story of the prodigal son, the wonderful story uh, of the two sons one who had squandered the inheritance, the one who stayed close to the inheritance, but really hadn't improved much in his life. 
resisting the love and the care of his father. And interesting about that, we read at the beginning of that chapter um, that Jesus, observing those who were listening, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, at which the Pharisees and scribes murmured, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's cool, isn't it? How neat. He welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's what we are doing every time we do this in memory of him. Man, he would have been eating on his own if he didn't do that. But thank God, that is the grace of our faith. He welcomes sinners and eats with them. And that's the core of Eucharist. And uh, it says in the passage, So he addressed these parables to them. That was those who were within earshot, the religious leadership, scribes and Pharisees. He addressed those parables to them. And then we begin chapter 16, and it says, And then he turned to his disciples, and he told them this parable. This parable that is really complicated, it's hard to identify, where Jesus stops speaking and Luke continues the message, or continues to try to give us an application of that message. It's very complex. Much has been written about it over the years. Scripture scholars have spent a huge amount of time on this. And the interesting thing about the parable is it's found only in St. Luke's Gospel. It's not in the parallel Gospels of the Synoptics, Matthew or Mark. It's only here. And so we've got to labor the story to really try and understand. A huge amount, as I said, has been written about it. And so I invite you to go back during the course of the week. Look at the opening of chapter 16. How does it speak to you? We know the initial story of the steward who had responsibilities. He dissipated the property. It's the very same language as the prodigal son. And uh, Jesus is inviting them to go beyond the parable. I'm sure when they got aside from the crowds, they had a lot of questions for him. What do you mean by this parable of the steward? Who is commending him saying, man, he was a good steward, but he dissipated the property? Who is saying all of that? And they're very challenging reflections. Great deal has been written, but there's no single agreement as to what is actually meant or what the interpretation of the parable is. But there are a few things that really stand out. Number one, an invitation, be trustworthy. Be reliable. Be trustworthy in small things, and you will most likely be trustworthy in larger things. And the second is, he speaks of, you're very prudent in dealing in your relationships with one another. How come you don't have that same prudence in relationship to me? Is it because we don't practice, practice and engage him and engage his invitation? And uh, thirdly, as you make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth, what was that about? We all have some dishonest wealth, trash and stuff that we've picked up along the way, maybe from our earliest days. And we think that is the valuable way of navigating or negotiating things. Maybe it's what Linda Rooney is asking us. Let behind those nets. What are some of the things that I need to let behind in my workplace, my family, my environment, and my relationships? What are some of the nets that I might need to surrender in order to hear him? And what Jesus is saying, uh, uh, as you make friends with dishonest wealth, dishonest practices, be certain that it's bound to fail. Because it does. It always fails. But know that I am still there with you all of that time. I'm ready to forgive and join you to me. The big uh, expression of all of those parables. I am searching and searching for you and for that relationship. And in essence, what he is saying is, why not choose to surrender some things that are of no value in my life 
in my practice, in my relationships. So as you study uh, in your small groups or study the book on your own, I encourage you to be attentive to his invitation. Let go of your nets, come and follow me.